Hi there, I'm Tassia Boschman. I'm a communications agent at the Rest Coast CBDC's Hire for Talent. I'm joining you today from the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq First Nations on which we are learning and working. Join with me is Marco Pasca, an award-winning entrepreneur, accessibility consultant, and inspirational speaker with cerebral palsy. Without getting into too much detail, Marco and I will be discussing employer awareness about disability in the workplace. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Marco. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me today. And I have to be honest, as somebody with a disability myself, this is not just something that I'm passionate about because of the work that I've been involved in, but you know, it's a real personal experience for me, having been born with cerebral palsy and as a wheelchair user every single day, I've interacted with this. So I've literally lived through some of the experiences that I'm about to share with all of you today. So I do have a bit of a presentation uh, I'm going to share it with the audience here. Uh, before we really get into the nitty gritty of things that I like to say was, is communicating with confidence uh, for people with disabilities. I like to say that it's super important that we first understand a, a little bit more about disability and how it may be impacting uh, the people that we work with. You know, in order to best support the community members and the team members that we work with, we first have to understand their individual circumstances. And I actually think that that comes down to how we define disability. So when you think of disability, you might first think of something like this, a wheelchair, maybe a hearing aid or a cochlear implant for someone, or a, a white stick or a white cane for somebody uh, who is blind. But what about the things that we can't see, right? What about hidden disabilities? Disabilities like anxiety and depression, ADHD, autism, learning disabilities. Many of these disabilities, you wouldn't be able to tell from the naked eye that somebody had these conditions. And for one reason or another, a lot of employees choose to not you know, disclose that information. A lot of the times I've learned as an accessibility consultant and in the field, it's because they're afraid of the stigma that might follow with that that you know, having this disability might impact their ability to do the job and do it well. And so many people choose to kind of hide their true self because they don't want their manager or their fellow employees to kind of hold that against them and have that stigma. Now, even though my disability is a little bit more visual, I do use a manual wheelchair, that doesn't mean I've been free from stigmas in the workplace. In fact, the very first time that I faced stigmas in the workplace happened to be when I did a co-op in grade 11 in high school. And so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story of what that was like for me. So I remember this story all too well. I love this job. I got a job at a computer store and I've always loved technology because of the way in which technology enhances people's abilities. So I did really well. I did so well, in fact, that during this co-op, after my co-op period was done, I actually asked the manager if he felt like I could join his team in a full-time capacity. I'll never forget the look on his face. He kind of paused, he looked at me, and he's like, oh, Marco, you know, I'd love to talk to you about this, but could maybe I take you out for lunch first? Now, not being a guy who's ever afraid to say no to a free lunch, I said, sure, of course. And so he and I went out and he explained to me that as much as he wanted me to join the team in a full-time capacity, he had some concerns. I didn't know this, but he'd actually been modifying my tasks the entire time I was in the co-op program. And he let me know this. I've actually been modifying the things that you've been doing because I was afraid. I asked him, what were you afraid of? Well, you know, if you had to say, you know, do certain things like lift heavy boxes or reach up high and something were to fall on you and hurt, you were to hurt yourself, well, I just couldn't live with myself. So I've been modifying your tasks to make it a little bit easier. You, you can imagine how shocked I was because I had no idea. I thought that this was just the standard way that role went. And in that moment, I could have been easily offended about what he was telling me and said, are you kidding me? That's terrible. And rolled out of the restaurant and been done with it. But instead, I took this as an opportunity to sort of open his eyes, to change his perspectives. And I said to him, look, I totally understand your concerns, but how about this? How about you give me another two weeks to prove myself, like an extended probationary period, except this time we don't modify any of the tasks. And if, you're, if I'm able to do exactly what you expect me to do within the role and the job description, then absolutely I'll continue to work on. But if I'm not able to do it, then no harm, no foul. Just like anyone else, you can say that, uh, you know, I have to move on in my employment. Well, he liked the compromise actually. So the very next day I started the job 
in this full-time capacity. And as you know, uh, the universe works in mysterious ways. So uh, as it would happen, a customer came in and he asked for a video card. But video cards happened to be on the very top shelf, something that I knew I was not going to be able to reach. But I assessed my environment. I knew what I was capable of. I knew my abilities. And so as I was talking to the gentleman and learning a little bit more about what he was looking for in a video card, I realized that he was about six foot three, six foot four. And so as we're walking towards that area, I'm chatting him up and I know that the card that he needs is probably at the very back. So I kind of said, oh yeah, I think that card right there will work for you. And I looked up at him and I looked up at the card and I gestured to reach, even though I knew fully that I wasn't going to be able to reach the card. And as I was reaching up, I looked back over at him. And before I could say anything, he reached over and said, yes, exactly. This is the card. Grabbed the card, handed it to me. And now I was able to make him the sale. Now, the amazing part of this story isn't just the fact that I used his physical ability to be able to grab me something, but it was that this entire time that manager had been watching this entire social interaction go down and his jaw had nearly hit the floor. It was in that moment, I think that he realized that no matter what situation I was going to be put in, that I was going to be the best person to assess how I would be able to get the job done. And although he had really positive intentions by modifying the role, that he shouldn't have made those assumptions. He should have asked me what was, I was capable of. And he knew from that moment on that his perception of me had completely changed. And I ended up working for that computer store for several more years as a result of that one moment of showing my ability. So it was pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Absolutely. It's so amazing that you had the confidence and you took the time to explain to that manager and have him open his eyes because he probably changed his percep- his perception forever, really. Yeah, absolutely. No, he, he definitely was like, you know what? In showing me, it's one thing to tell someone something, but in showing me, you really proved to me that, you know, I was placing a lot of these restrictions on you. You weren't yeah. placing them on yourselves. And they were just sort of scenarios that as a manager, I was playing out in my head when really I could have taken the time to have a sidebar with you, tell you a little bit more about what is going to be expected in the role as a full-time employee, disability or not. Ask my own concerns, not necessarily about specifically saying about your disability, but are there things that I can do to support you in doing those tasks? Or are there things before you get started that I should know about? But I guess because I was in high school, he'd maybe never interacted with somebody with a disability before. We were both learning at the same time. And so we didn't know really how to dive into it in the ways that would make sense. But you're absolutely right. So this next piece here I want to get into is the communicating with confidence piece. This kind of actually segues perfectly into what we were talking about with that manager and sort of if he had the skills or, or the knowledge on how to communicate with me stronger, right? So communicating with confidence. So now that we understand a little bit more about disability and sort of what individuals can go through, let's talk a little bit more about some of the techniques around communicating with different kinds of individuals with disabilities and not feeling awkward about it. I think really the key here is remembering what I call the golden rule. And it's the golden rule for everyone, really. When in doubt, treat someone as you wish to be treated. Put the person first. Never, ever uh, place your assumptions. I mean, you heard in the previous story, right? It's like when I was talking about the manager, he was automatically, he never nefariously was doing this and, and, you know, maliciously placing these assumptions on me, but, you know, he could have just asked me. So remember that I am a person first and it's okay to ask those kinds of questions. People don't always remember to carry on those things that you learn in every situation that you're in. Well, I think that it also can be a little bit awkward too, because some employers don't know um, what the legal aspect of it is when you're in a workplace environment. And they think, well, this isn't just a regular social interaction and I don't want, you know, litigation against me, or I don't want to say or do the wrong thing. So let's talk a little about a bit about those expressions and, and the things to say. So oftentimes people get tripped up. I'm a wheelchair user, as I've said. And so oftentimes I've been out in workplaces, uh, you know, when I was working for other people and people would be like, hey, Marco, you know, did you want to go for a walk? And immediately feel completely awkward and start tripping up on their words. I mean, a role or, um, you know, that kind of thing. And it's, I want to stress this. It's important to remember that some of these terminologies are just common nomenclature. So if you say, hey, let's go for a walk. 
the the activity of walking in general however you happen to be moving in the activity is totally fine and most people in the disability community will be completely understanding of that the same thing is like going up to someone who's blind and being like hey it's nice to see you you know because you can see the person even if they can't see you or if they have limited vision that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be offended or i haven't heard from you in a while for someone who's deaf you know all of these things are generally speaking fine. And you shouldn't necessarily think that someone's automatically gonna take offense. I think the key here is, is it comes down to your intention. So when you said those things, were you intentionally trying to be joking or, or kind of putting that person down, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so someone who uses a wheelchair, uh, you know, they may say that they're going for a walk or, you know, or, and so you can feel comfortable inviting them to do so. But of course, you know, going a little bit deeper into that, saying things like, what, are you blind? Are you deaf? Or that's so retarded. Obviously, these are things that, or language that we would like to try to avoid because of the fact that there's a little bit more uh, of malicious intent behind that. Exactly. So like you said, it really does go back to the intent that you had when you were choosing those words. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And, and remembering that this individual, before they came and they interacted with you, they've had dozens and dozens and hundreds of interactions with friends, family members, other people, school. So, you know, they're going to know their comfort level. And it's important to talk to that person, to understand that you're looking and directly talking to the person who has the disability, not the person that they're with. Uh, for example, my wife, she's able-bodied. And so I guess you'd say that we're an inter-able couple because she's able-bodied and I use a wheelchair. But you wouldn't believe the amount of times that we've been out, say, at like restaurants or different things. And someone will look at uh, her, and, you know, as a grown man, as a grown adult, they'll look at her and they'll say... Uh, they'll say, uh, oh, uh, does he have any food allergies? And, and by, by me saying grown man, grown adult, I'm sitting there thinking, are you kidding me? And my wife is like, oh, well, why didn't you ask him, right? So again, there's the assumption that, oh, he's in the wheelchair. That must mean that there is something else going on or that I might not be able to communicate with him, right? Right, and people should, I, like, they should probably just start with by asking the person themselves. Yeah, look at and the person, if- not... Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, and if that person isn't able, that it'll they'll be able to indicate that, and the the person that they're with will be able to jump in at that point. So always start with the person. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Like for example, if someone does have an attendant or someone who is supporting them with forms of communication, that type of thing will become a little bit more obvious right out the gate. And and oftentimes, as you just said, um, you know, that will be let known ahead of time, ahead of the interaction. Um, but still, even if someone does have an attendant, re- make sure that you're giving the dignity to the person by looking directly at them as a person and not at their uh, attendant. And just don't place yeah. those assumptions on that person, right? Because you don't know, even though someone may have some cognitive delays or they may have speech challenges, that doesn't mean that they are not an incredibly intelligent person underneath their speech challenges. And they're just asking for you to have some compassion to work with them and work within their abilities, right? Absolutely. So other things we might want to avoid, okay, this may seem obvious, but things like labels that are unflattering. So she's insane, he's a schizo. Using words like challenged or handicapped. You know, I live with a disability and yes, there are days in which it can be challenging, but everyone has days that are challenging. And the word handicap, it's so important to understand um, where that term or that word comes from, right? So Handicap, I was actually told by uh, another individual that it actually stems from way back when in like the 1800s, when people with disabilities were left to fend for themselves um, on the streets. And many of them would become buskers and kind of have skills or talents that they would develop, like singing, dancing, that sort of thing. And they would use a cap to collect the cash, um, you know, in order to, you know, uh, of the things that they were doing. And people would walk by who would say, well, isn't that a handicap? Now, I don't know for certain if that origin story is true. This is something I've been told by multiple people. But let me put it simply, okay? When you're playing something like golf and you play with a handicap, you're playing with a disadvantage, right? So remember that language and words have power. And the ways in which we approach these words, you know, is really going to impact how people feel about themselves and the places in which they work. Absolutely. Um, I can't believe these words are even still being used. 
it's isn't it crazy it's it's exactly. mind-blowing to me like so to try to avoid using words towards people's mental health even like even if it isn't a visible disability saying uh you know things like oh she should take her happy pills she needs to calm down or he's psycho or she's a lunatic like these are things we want to avoid and i couldn't believe it i had a presentation a while back and i was talking about words that i was still seeing used in the media even in print journalism and online Things like wheelchair bound man vows he'll walk one day. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm not physically bound by rope to my wheelchair. So wheelchair bound is not a great term. And yet it's still in the journalism book of approved terminology, even to today's standards in 2021. Suffering from, affected by, a victim of, I'm not a victim of my disability. It's a part of who I am, right? Can you imagine if we were saying this about any other type of person for any other reason, whether it was their sexuality, the color of their skin, any of these things, you know, people would automatically go, well, of course, that's not right. But for some reason, when it comes to individuals with disabilities, there seems to be a little bit more um, leeway there, at least from the media's perspective, at least that's in my own personal experiences. It's too bad. It's completely unacceptable. Absolutely. Hopefully this can shed some right? light on. And this is why it's important to think about this language as well in the terminology of your workplace. Um, you know, on your website, are you using inclu inclusive terminology? You know, it's one thing to say that you're inclusive of all applicants, regardless of their sexuality or their abilities, but are you actually showing that? Are, you know, be conscientious of that. What is your organization showing for social media? Even if you're a smaller organization, a small mom and pop pie shop, you know, what kind of message, what kind of brand do you really want to present out there, right? This is not about being afraid of hurting everyone's feelings. I want to be very clear of that, but it's just using the common sense of understanding that some of these words really truly do dehumanize people. Um, they take away the ability of really focusing on that person's abilities. And we'll, we'll get into that in a second here. So what about some of the accessible devices? Now, I'm sure you've come across some of these devices yourself, actually, or some of these things in the community, but you know the terminology around the things that we'll see. So a lot of times we still use the term handicap parking, right? But the parking spot itself is not handicapped in any way, right? So I like to advocate for you know accessible parking or universally designed parking, right? Because it's accessible parking. It's making it easier for someone. Same thing with universally designed washroom or accessible washroom. And I don't know if you know this, but uh, it's a manual wheelchair or a day chair for a standard manual wheelchair. A lot of wheelchair users will call that, oh, that's my day chair. And sometimes they actually have a chair that they use for other circumstances, whether that's wheelchair basketball, or you can see the sports wheelchair there. Um, it's called a power chair, not an electric chair. An electric chair, as we know, is a totally different thing. And we definitely don't want to be sending anybody to the electric chair anytime <laughs> soon uh, with a disability, right? Um, a scooter. As we said, white cane, guide dog. Have you ever interacted with guide dogs? Um, yes, in the I have. Yep, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, and so like that's the thing too. It's like it's developing that comfort level around not only the devices but the assistance, and the assistance can all come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And I'm sure that when you were working with those guide dogs, you probably had the individual who was using the guide dog say, "Well, actually, um, you know." Uh, you're not supposed to touch my guide dog when they're, they're working and they have their vest on, right? But it's okay Absolutely. to kind of ask for clearance with that person uh, because yeah. sometimes um, they're in training or sometimes they're not working even though their vest is still on. So I always say, you know, just ask the person. Absolutely. They're always so adorable to you. Your gut instinct is to go pet them but they're at work. Immediately, right? You want to run up and pet them, but you have to understand that sometimes running up and petting a guide dog is going to break their habits. It's going to break the training that they've already received. Now, Absolutely. if there's sports fans out there, para ice sledge or sledge hockey is the image you see on the bottom left there. Um, a prosthesis uh, or prosthetic leg or prosthetic limb. A uh, hearing aid, uh, which we've all probably seen, and a cochlear implant. Cochlear implants are amazing devices. I don't know if you know much about them, but they're like a hearing aid, but they're like a hearing aid 2.0 because there's actually surgery involved that is uh, that basically attaches a device on the inside of the skull that uh, hardwires 
information, like sound information, to go right to the cochlear bone in the skull. And that actually allows people who do qualify for an implant to basically have that information directly fed to their eardrums um, through the device. And so it's really, really neat when somebody has an implant and a workplace or say a uh, symposium or a theater has the ability for you to turn on Bluetooth or other abilities for you to have that sound directly go into the person's uh, head if they're, using, um, if they're using these devices and say they're doing like a walking tour or something of that nature. So now let's get into some tips about interacting with people with disabilities. Number one thing is ask the person how you can help. Allow the person to tell you, much like in my story, how they can be helped. And if they say no, don't assume that they're being rude about saying no. Like if they say no, listen to them. They're going to know their comfort level and their strengths. Um, and if you know of a piece of equipment that is at your workplace that could help them, whether you have like a laminated communication board with general devices that somebody could point at, or if there's like a removable wooden ramp or something that you can bring out to get them over a threshold, you know, let them know that, that equipment is available. If you're a sports uh, uh, fitness uh, provider, if you have like accessible equipment that was going to make it easier for them to work out, let them know, right? And avoid trying to relate to the person. I, I, you know, I'll tell you the number of people who have come up to me and seen my cool wheelchair because I have red tires and you know flashing lights sometimes that I can turn on and off. And people will come up to me and we're like, "Oh man, that's such a cool wheelchair." You know what? I actually was in a wheelchair for like two months when I broke my leg, and it sucked. Like as much as you're trying to be relatable to the person, believe it or not, I've actually had people come up to me and say something like that. And I know that they're trying to be kind and I know they're trying to be relatable, but it's not quite the same circumstance as if you were born with a disability and you've kind of lived through that your entire life, right? Absolutely. And then lastly here, the final point is never speak about them as though they're not there. So always assume the person can understand you, even if they're nonverbal, don't, don't assume that, okay, now I'm just going to talk to mom or I'm going to talk to their attendant because they're not retaining this information. Absolutely not. Those assumptions will get us in trouble. And ultimately they're not going to make that person feel great. So mobility devices, this is something that I can really relate to. Obviously being a mobility uh, chair user, always ask before you touch someone's wheelchair. Okay, never assume that, oh, I see them going up a hill. I'm just gonna go ahead and grab them and start pushing. You wouldn't believe, I live in uh, Vancouver, um, in British Columbia. And when I'm in downtown Vancouver and I'm wheeling up Granville Street, Granville Street is like a main downtown hub street. It's very, very steep. So when I come off the Sky Train, people automatically, and this is maybe my fault too, because I have what I like to call resting grimace face, where it always <laughs> looks like I'm intense when I'm wheeling, like I've, I'm on a mission. So maybe it looks like I'm, I'm, I'm uncomfortable or I'm struggling. But the amount of times I've been pushing and I have earbuds in or something, and all of a sudden I feel this gush of wind come behind me and I feel someone pushing my chair. I always have my fingers crossed. Oh, please be somebody I know. Please be somebody I know. And I always turn around. And it's never someone I know. It's a complete stranger. And I always say, I'm sorry, can I help you? And they're like, oh, no, no, no. I'm, I'm helping you. You look like you were struggling there. Like, let me help you. Like, again, fantastic that you have the right intentions, but always ask, tap me on the shoulder. Hey, can I give you a hand there? You know, get, you know, give me some notice because especially now in a time of the pandemic and as we're started, starting to restart, remember people's personal bubble, right? And if you were to grab someone who was ambulatory, someone who was walking and just start walking with them, I'm pretty sure they would assume that you were trying to take them somewhere. You were trying to assault them or something, right? So Absolutely. make sure that you remember <laughs> to ask the person first, right? Now, uh, when you are talking with somebody in a wheelchair, it's important to remember to sit down and be at their eye level. Now, this doesn't always apply because, again, you want to make sure that you're respecting someone's personal bubble. Um, don't feel as though you have to take a knee to get to eye level. But if you can find a chair or something where you can be at their eye level and you're not looking down at them if they're in a chair, then that's great. But always, you know, ask the person again. You can say, hey, uh, I, this is kind of uncomfortable for me to, to be leaning down like this. Did you want me to be sitting at eye level with you? Would that make it a little bit easier? You know, but of, of course, you know, be respectful of that. And many times somebody's mobility device can actually be an extension of their very personality. You heard me talk about how my chair is red and black. I've got some lights. So I look at my chair and I accessorize my chair personally, like it's an extension of who I am as a person, just the same way as you would get maybe some 
funky new shoes or a brand new dress or things like that. It really does reflect their personality and it isn't always to be seen as a medical device. Now, uh, people who are blind or who have low vision, introduce yourself in the interaction. Uh, uh, you know, it goes without saying that they probably won't see, even if they have some form of vision, because even though they're blind or have low vision, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're completely blind. But it's important to introduce the fact that, you know, oh, uh, myself, Sally and Jim are actually in the room right now. Um, and we're in this room. Actually, there's a chair to the right of you. Um, so we're actually going to be walking over to the interview space that's about uh, 10 feet from here and to your left. Right. So when you're passing someone, for example, and they're maybe already in a in an, another uh, discussion or interaction, remember that even if they aren't visually impaired, you would probably let them know or give them some sort of indication like, oh, hey, on your left or let them know that you're passing on their side. So if you can let them know, don't try to sneak past them, because if they don't know you're there and then they go to back up and trip over you, you know, that can be uh, problematic. So as I said, assume that they can see you, even if a little bit, because sometimes people have just their peripheral vision. Sometimes they have 10, 20% of their vision. Never grab or touch someone and, uh, and, and without letting them know of your intention. And again, this is uh, like with the wheelchair situation. Uh, I was waiting for a SkyTrain uh, months and months ago. And there was somebody that uh, was waiting for the SkyTrain as well, who appeared to be blind. They had a white cane and all that sort of thing. And the SkyTrain pulled up and the doors opened. And there was a person next to them and the, the person, I guess, assumed that the person who was blind didn't know the train had arrived and they had waited a few seconds and this person blessed them. They were trying to be helpful, but the person who was standing next to them, who was a stranger, by the way, just grabbed onto them and started pulling them towards the train or to the tracks. And this person started screaming like you wouldn't believe. Obviously, the person who, who had low vision said, ah, get off me. Don't touch me. And I couldn't believe, but the person next to them was actually a little bit offended. And I was like, I was just trying to help you, but I want you to put yourself in their shoes for a second. Imagine what that would be like. All of a sudden you're standing there, you know that there is electricity or potential danger in front of you. And now you're being pulled towards the direction of tracks. I mean, how would that make you feel, right? It would be terrifying. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so like, I never try to uh, say that I know exactly what that must be like. But I mean, I think any one of us can relate to the fact that we don't want to necessarily be pulled towards traffic or be pulled no. towards a train. So if you want to help the person, ask that person, right? Ask them how they would like to be guided. My, my wife, she's amazing. She's the universal design and accessibility specialist for the city of Surrey. And we have a, uh, a friend of ours who's a blind, he's actually blind and he's a reporter. Uh, and he was coming over to interview her and he was blown away because my wife has interacted with lots of people with disabilities in the past. And before he could do anything, she asked him how he would like to be guided. So he, she said, you know, Grant, could I, could I, you know, do you want to grab onto the back of my shoulder or did you want to maybe grab onto my elbow? What would make the most comfortable if we we're doing a bit of a walking tour, what would make it the most easiest for you? And he was blown away that she made these offerings because he'd only ever wished in other interactions that somebody would say like, actually, yeah, like could, 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 you know, I do something to make this easier for you. And then he can dictate what would make it a little bit easier. Right. And like, aren't these like no brainers that once you think of them, you're like, yeah, that, that seems so simple, right? This makes complete sense. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so when you are going through these space, offer to provide a little bit of a tour, right? So uh, narrate where things are. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, there's a washroom key um, just about a foot above your head here to the side. If you need to use the washroom, let us know. Um, it's just down the hallway. Provide clear uh, verbal cues. Like I said earlier, on your left, or there's a set of five stairs, knowing the number of stairs is actually kind of important because if there is one less step and they go to step and then they kind of, you know, really take a bigger step, they, they could fall, they could hurt themselves on the stairs. So if you do have that information at hand, you know, try to have that readily available, right? Now, for someone who's deaf and hard of hearing, again, very similar sort of ways of interaction, but different. So when you're trying to get that person's attention, actually get their attention. Use visual cues, a gentle touch on the arm, these kinds of things. Um, speak clearly and normally. Don't try to over enunciate. If the person's uh, hard of hearing and they are really used to lip reading, for example, you don't want to be like, you know, doing things like, 
oh, it's so nice to see you. It's so nice to meet you. And kind of over enunciating in a way because that's going to throw off the lip reading that they're used to doing normally, right? Yeah, exactly. That would make it more challenging for them, if anything. Yes, exactly. Um, face the person, make eye contact. And like I said earlier, use gestures. You can write things down on, say, post-it notes or a notepad. Try to minimize the background sounds or environment. So if you're going to be taking somebody to a, for a job interview, prior to even hiring them on or having them um, you know, come in for the interview, let people know in that introductory email, congratulations, we're going to be interviewing you on Tuesday. You can let them know what they're to be expecting, right? So for example, when you arrive, we do actually have accessible parking spaces available if you require them. And the room in which we'll be meeting is a very quiet space, um, but and we've kind of tucked ourselves off to the side. So let them know of the spaces in which you're going to. Try to minimize that background sound because they may have not disclosed yet to anybody that they have any form of disability and they may be not comfortable yet disclosing that yet. So if you can do things to minimize the challenges, the better, right? Like avoiding chewing gum and finding those quieter environments. That's great advice. And lastly, somebody with communication disabilities. And this is probably one of the questions that I get most around um, these types of things because people have never worked with somebody who potentially uses a communication be board before or things like that. So if they have comprehension challenges, be face-to-face -face with them and make eye contact. Watch for their understanding and make sure that you stop and say one thing at a time. You know, give that, give a chance for the listener to respond. You know, they may have a bit of a delay. So pausing and giving them a little bit of time to, to respond to what it is you're saying is so, so important. Um, keep the language simple. Try not to use terminology that is specific to your industry, at least right out the gate. If there is specific acronyms or things like that that they need to learn later for the job, that's one thing. But, you know, try to start off by using playing language the best that you can. Don't ask questions that you already know the answer to because then it's just going to prolong things. And here's a really important one. Speak to someone as though it's age appropriate for their age. So please, 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 even if they have some cognitive or comprehension delays, don't use things like baby talk, especially with adults or youth. You know, give them the respect of speaking to them in a normal pace, in a normal tone, and they'll be the judge of what they need to do. If you can, use pictures gestures, things that are written down. If they don't have a communication board, but there are specific things and you know this person has accessibility requirements or supports needed before they come in for an interview, if you have things that they would interact with, like the coffee machine or the washrooms or things like this, you can print out a little piece of paper with some of these things as you're pointing them out, the coffee machine, the, you know, the, the washroom. Um, you can point them out or you can have them point them out if they have questions around those things and you can laminate that piece of paper and you can have that sort of ready-made, I don't know, lack of a better term, cheat sheet ready to go. A lot of these things like employers would assume that um, these are going to cost a lot of money or that, um, you know, I just can't make these kinds of accommodations. A lot of these things only cost a few dollars, if anything at all. And oftentimes, a lot of the accommodations comes around you adjusting your attitude and your, your assumptions on people than it is like having to purchase something specifically. Oftentimes, right. people with disabilities, depending on the disability, they'll come with the equipment that works for them or that makes their lives a bit easier. And finally, touching on somebody, if they have um, a speech challenges, so if someone can't think of a word, ask them to describe it. Ask them to give you a little bit more of a description. Ask for clarification if you don't understand. If they have speech challenges and you're having a tough time as an employer or as an interviewer, um, you know, ask them for a little bit more clarification and give them the time to really go through that. Listen and wait, as we said earlier. If they have a stutter or difficulty, please try not to interrupt them. Um, and if they're using a communication board, face them and they'll kind of talk through or use the board. Some of them have audio playback. So they may be using things like an iPad that will play back the things that they want to say. And some of them will be using an analog board at which they want to point to. So look at them first. And then if they're trying to get your attention and looking at that particular thing that they want to get your attention on, they'll point to that thing and they'll, they'll kind of be clear about the communication. Right. And so if someone has a speech challenge and you do need them to repeat, it's OK to repeat and ask for confirmation. Just make sure that you're patient throughout the situation. Absolutely. We're almost done here. Here's the final wrap up points. 
Why is this important? Well, it teaches us to approach the situation with empathy and not sympathy. So try to empathize with the person and what they're going through. You're never necessarily going to understand completely what they're going through, but you can empathize with some of the things that maybe are making life a little bit more difficult, right? Change the focus uh, to their abilities instead of being like, oh, wow, I can't believe you can't do this or that. You know, focus on the things that they can do. I mean, look at what I was able to unlock um, about my own abilities and the perceptions of that manager in the computer store and encourage an open dialogue, right? So if, you know, you have programs in your workplace like mental health programs, or you're open to doing things like lunch and learns to learn a little bit more about disability, let the person know. Don't assume that they're gonna wanna be this disability advocate for their kind of disability, but definitely let them sort of uh, let you know how they would best like to interact with the other employees and let them know how they can be supported. And that ties in to these final pieces of what we can all do about it. You have to set the tone from the top. So if you're the founder of your business, if you're the business leader, even if it's a small business, remember that the tone that you set really sets precedence for the rest of your employees. So if you're saying that you're inclusive, truly be about being inclusive. Allow yourself to be vulnerable. I worked with a lot of employers where mental health has become sort of a hot topic lately. And even though some of these were medium sized and larger size employers, when I started to explain that I myself have actually gone through mental health challenges, anxiety and depression as a guy who's an inspirational speaker, that really opened up. And I only ever opened up about that about two years ago in a workplace that I was working with. And I guess because I opened up that, you know, here I am a bubbly guy with tons of energy, but I'm saying that I've struggled with anxiety and depression. I think I inspired one of the CEOs because he came forward and he said, you know what, I've struggled with anxiety and depression myself as well. And I want to let the team know. And this is the first time I'm kind of coming forward and letting the team know. And within a week's time, they had different Slack groups and different like Microsoft Teams groups opening up, talking about mental health because that business leader gave permission, said it was okay to be yourself at work expressed a little bit of vulnerability, right? And then everyone else, they thought that maybe like 10 people from the, the workplace would show up to these conversations that they would do every Friday. And over 80% of employees were showing up to these conversations because wow. everybody can relate to this one way or another. Absolutely. It just goes to prove that the more we talk about it, the more it breaks the stigma. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Be communicative. Talk to your employees. Talk to the people that you're working with. Let them know that you're human too, that you have vulnerabilities. And when I say provide accommodations in this next point here, I don't just mean, oh my goodness, it's a $10,000 ramp or it's an elevator. Yes, those are accommodations, but sometimes accommodations can be flexibility with work hours. Sometimes it can be a task light, uh, uh, offering them a task light to have at their desk so that they can see things better in low light. Sometimes Sometimes it's if they need magnification software on their laptop or their computer, can you ask them maybe, has there been a piece of software that has helped you in the past that I could really support you with by getting that installed or what has worked for you? You know, be creative with that person. Sometimes flexibility and getting them to start at 10 a.m. instead of 9 a.m. because they're a new parent. I myself, I'm a, I'm a dad with a disability. I have a five-month-old daughter. And so for me, having to adjust now, not only to being an entrepreneur, but having a five month old who, you know, is just wonderful. I had to make adaptions to my house, to her crib, to make my life easier. And these things were just using my intuitiveness and working with people that could help me and support me. You don't have to be the subject matter expert. There are disability service organizations that are out there. Maybe you've worked with some actually. Um, that um, can give you advice around accommodations and supports that you can provide for people in the workplace. And it doesn't have to cost a whole heck of a lot of money. In fact, sometimes there's even grants available. On the Hire for Talent website, we do have a service provider map where people can find a service provider near them. Absolutely. And I'm really excited to say this. I don't know if I'm supposed to or not, but I'm actually going to be working with the Hire for Talent team to create four new accommodations documents in the coming months um, around accommodating people with disabilities, all from the beginning stages through the interview stages to the onboarding stages and beyond. So I'm really, really looking forward to expanding on some of the information that I'm talking about today and going a little bit deeper on these accommodations and how they don't have to cost a lot of money. The last thing here before I go off the screen share uh, again is 
um, team members, be a peer mentor. Remember what it was like your first day and how, how, um, how nerve wracking that must have been when you're starting a new job. Be open and welcoming. It sounds like a no brainer, but you know, honestly, sometimes people just don't think about these things and they think like, oh, I'm just too busy. I don't have time to, you know, be open and welcoming, but it goes a long way, especially if someone does have ADHD or an anxiety challenge and they're starting a new environment and they don't know where to go. And this is all exasperating those things. And with that, check your environment for potential barriers. You know, I know that we're going to be sort of transitioning from virtual back into the physical workplace or a hybrid model of sorts. But, you know, uh, people, you know, they might have movers boxes or things in the hallway and they're like, I'm just keeping that there temporarily. But they don't realize by putting that box there, they're actually reducing the amount of space it is to wheel through that hallway or that space. And that actually may create a tripping hazard or make it more challenging for somebody with a disability. The number one thing you can do is ask the person how you can best support. Don't be proud about it. Just ask the person what has been things that have supported them in the past um, that would really, really help them to fulfill their role. And with that, I'm going to stop the screen share um, and really just say that like this has been incredible. And I hope that you've gained some insights from this. I know we really quickly kind of went through this uh, within our sort of Facebook Live here within the half an hour window. But there's a lot of amazing nuggets there. And I hope that there's something for everyone that they were able to take away. Thank you so much, Marco. I know that I've certainly taken things away and I'm sure that employers all throughout Canada will as well. Fantastic. Well, I know that we're having an opportunity, I believe, for some question and answers, uh, you know, following our discussion here. So I'm definitely looking forward to having uh, an opportunity to answer some questions specifically. And please, please, please don't be nervous about the question. There is no silly question. OK, if it's on your mind, now is the time to ask it so that we can clear the air and have really an open and honest discussion. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us, and we'll look forward to seeing you guys in the chat box.